The earth is the Lord's. Everything inside that earth is the Lord's. The world and all its people belong to him. You are not an owner. You're not in an owner's role. And all of the stuff you've accumulated, the very gifts that you have to bring value to the company that rewarded you was from God. The next breath, if it weren't for the mercies of God, you couldn't catch your next breath in a SpaceX rocket. Even your next breath is a gift from God. I am not an owner. When you figure this out, it's liberating. I am not an owner. I am a manager of God's stuff that he allowed me in my life. If you would like weekly content that builds your faith and helps you walk out all that God has for your life, subscribe and be a part of Life Family. Here's what I know for sure. A deflated ball cannot bounce. Neither can a deflated marriage. Neither can a deflated friendship. Neither can a deflated business. Neither can a deflated church, neither can a deflated heart. A deflated ball cannot bounce. That's why scripture is full of wonderful uh, values and virtues that bring the bounce back into your life. I want to bounce back. I want my marriage to have a bounce back. I want my parenting to have a bounce back. I want my finances to have a bounce back. How many want a bounce back in your life? Bounce. He thought he was dying, and he probably was. He was lost in the desert. He had no water to quench his thirst. His body was beginning to shut down. What would he give for just a glass of cold water? Looking in the distance, he saw an old shack. And with all the strength he had left, he made his way toward that shack. He opened the door. To his surprise, there was a jar of crystal clear water sitting on the floor next to a pump. Reaching down, he picked up the jar. And beside the jar, he noticed a handwritten a note that said, use this water in the jar to prime the pump. When you are satisfied, refill the jar and leave it for the next person who will pass this way. Now he had a dilemma, didn't he? He had a decision to make. What if you followed the directions on the sign and there was no water in the well? He had to decide Do I consume what's in the jar for my immediate needs or do I invest it and take the chance that deep down there is so much more? And that is today's message. Will you consume what God gave you in the jar or invest it, refresh yourself and others who will come your way? It is a message on generosity. Generosity will put the bounce back in your life. Let's look into Scripture, John 12, 1 through 7, a marvelous passage of Scripture. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus. Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. What? A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Incredible. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. Watch this. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, womp, womp, womp. The disciple who would soon betray him said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied to Judas, leave Mary alone. 
She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Around this lesson of generosity, Jesus raises two hearts. One was deflated and one was inflated. Two questions. Why did Mary give such an extravagant gift? And secondly, why did it bother Judas so much? The greatest deflator of my life is selfishness. There was a season of my life I was so intensely selfish. Everything was about me and mine. And that was some of the most deflating years of my life. It, it hurt my marriage. It hurt my kids. It hurt me and it hurt others who were around me. Through a transformational miracle, God turned my heart and I became, and I got the bounce back through generosity. But selfishness, selfishness is a terrible thing. We are hardwired, born selfish. The first words that a child learns is mine. That's right. Mine, 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 mine. Drives you insane. Mine. One of the most difficult virtues that we as parents and grandparents teach our children is sharing. No, it's not just yours. You share your toys. You share. Now, whether you're a little tyke or you're a seasoned adult, selfishness is in us. It is something that God wants to bring transformation to through generosity. The way that he does that is he helps you understand this diagnostic question, who is the rightful owner of all that you have? Okay, you're in church, so you might say God. <laughs> but the truth is, when you get out of this building, you think, it's my stuff. It's mine. I am the rightful owner. My name is on the deed. My name is on the bank statements. The car's in my name. The house is in my name. The portfolio's in my name. Assets are in my name. It's my stuff, mine, mine. But is it yours? You are simply one aneurysm away from knowing the truth. You are one clogged artery valve away from knowing that truth. You are one virus away from knowing who really is the owner of all that you have. Psalms 24 and 1 says it like this, the earth is the Lord's. Who does the earth belong to? The Lord and everything in it. Now, I looked up the Hebrew for everything, and it means everything. <laughs> Thank you. The earth is the Lord's. Everything inside that earth is the Lord's. The world and all its people belong to him. You are not an owner. You're not in an owner's role. And all of the stuff you've accumulated, the very gifts that you have to bring value to the company that rewarded you was from God. The next breath, if it weren't for the mercies of God, you couldn't catch your next breath in a SpaceX rocket. Even your next breath is a gift from God. I am not an owner. When you figure this out, it's liberating. I am not an owner. I am a manager of God's stuff that he allowed me in my life. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 tells us, uh, one day you will give an accounting. This is called the judgment seat of Christ. Has nothing to do with salvation you wouldn't even be in this meeting if you weren't already saved. This is how you managed what God put in your hands. I took what was in your hand. I took what you gave me, God, and I accumulated, I hoarded, I amassed. Why? I had no God consciousness. I had no gospel uh, uh, plan. It was just for me and for mine. 
2 Corinthians 5 and 10, in that every one of you listening to me and every one of you in this room are going to have that meeting, a one-on-one with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so your pastor, loving you so much, wants to get you ready for that meeting. I want that meeting to go really well for you (laughs) because it's not going to go well for everybody. There's going to be some tears there and you're going to, you say, oh no, pastor, Uh, there's no tears in heaven. Is that what scripture says? There's no tears in heaven. What does it say? It says he wipes away the tears. When does he wipe away the tears from your eyes? When he shows you what he gave you. And what it was designed for and what you did with it. You drank the glass of water instead of investing it and priming the pump. There's going to be some tears on that day. The Lord's going to wipe them away. But there's going to be a lot of you life family people that are going to get a thumbs up. Because you had a good pastor. (laughs) And he's going to say to you, Well done, good and faithful servant. All right. If I believe that God owns it all, and according to Scripture, he allows me to manage it, then he has another thing to ask me. What does the rightful owner ask of me? All right. If I'm managing your goods, what do you want me to do? All right. He tells you, Leviticus 27 and 30. Leviticus is the foundational chapter of principles of God. Look what he says, one-tenth, 10%, one-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields, fruit from the trees, who does it belong to? Belongs to the Lord and must be set apart. This can't be part of your budget. This is set apart to him as holy. The word holy means set apart, set apart for the master God's use. So one-tenth of the produce Now, this was talking to an agrarian society. We're not so much agrarian as we are tech and and oil and gas and and all that stuff, Uh, real estate, so forth. Whatever you do to make a living, he says, I'm going to bless you. And when I do, one-tenth of the produce belongs to me. I want you to bring it to me. Now, some of you are starting to figure up that that's hefty. (laughs) I make a lot, I make a lot of coins. Yes, you do make a lot of coins. And that's why the Lord blessed you with those coins. And he asked you, I want you to set aside 10%, acknowledging that I'm the one that gave it to you. Now, if you think that your charm and your brains and, and your might and your team produced everything you have and God had nothing to do with it, the rest of this message does not apply to you. But if you are someone that says, God, you're the rightful owner, you allow me to be the manager of some incredible blessing, then one-tenth is to be set apart to be holy to the Lord. What do you do with God's one-tenth? Two things. You can either bring it to your church or you can consume it. That's the two choices. The one-tenth belongs, you bring that as an acknowledgement of God who gave you everything to your church. You don't do 2% over there, 3% over there, 1% over there. No, 10%, one-tenth comes to your church. And you have to believe that your church has an aggressive master plan for everybody who brings us their holy tithe. We have an amazing finance team, and we have an amazing vision for bringing transformation to the cities that we love. We are planting churches. We come alongside 50 nonprofits. We have given them millions of dollars. We are impacting students and kids and senior citizens. We are aggressively using what God brings through you to touch the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one-tenth is undesignated. I know there are a lot of people sometimes that that say, I feel like giving this to the church. I feel like this belongs to the Lord, but I want it to go too. But no, you don't say, I want to designate 
tithes. The reason the one-tenth is undesignated is that it belongs to God. We are still trying to uh, control what God does with his money. No, you give it because he's the Lord of everything you have, and he asks you to do that, and it will put the bounce back in your life. I can't explain it. I just know it works. Sometimes when I'm preaching along, just random thoughts come in my head, and you're like, what, what in the world is that? And it just dawned on me that I'm, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> and it also uh, dawned on me that I did not bring my wallet, my credit cards, or cash, and I... You know, that's a problem. So I wonder if there's somebody that could, could give me some money so I can eat. Uh, hello, Bruce. What you got? Uh, about $60. $60. That's a good That'll get me one taco <laughs> and some water. Good taco. Anyway. Thank you, Bruce. You, you are so kind. I appreciate that. So very kind. <laughs> can we talk about that for a second? Why was Bruce... So excited. Were you excited, Bruce? Oh, he looked excited. Why was he so excited to give me money for lunch? Anybody? Yes, he does love me. He sure does. Uh, but what you probably doesn't know is before the service began, I gave Bruce $60. <laughs> And the reason he's so happy to give it back to me, it was never his. When I come into the house of the Lord with God's holy tenth, I am rejoicing in my heart. I'm not grieving or sad. Listen, selfishness attacks us before we give and grief attacks us after we give. I'm not grieving and I'm not selfish because this was never mine in the first place. This one-tenth belongs to the Lord. That's why I can give it so cheerfully without grieving. A wonderful uh, family in the church uh, got in touch with me a couple of weeks ago through our business office. And they said, we want to talk to uh, Pastor Andy about something wonderful that's happened in our life. Okay. So I called them. I said, uh, how can I help you? They said, oh, Pastor, you know, we started our mom and pop uh, business, and uh, we worked diligently in it, you know, building it, pouring our life into it. And the other day, a very large company, much larger than us, uh, asked to buy us out, and they gave us a number that was mind-boggling. And we said, yes, we'll, we'll sell our business to you. And they said that that money just got transferred to us, and uh, it's just more money than, than, than we've ever seen. And uh, the first thing we thought, Pastor, was we've got to give our church one-tenth. We've got to give the church the tithe. But he said, I have to tell you, uh, it's the largest check I've ever written. And he said, my hand is shaking right now. <laughs> and he said, if you don't get over here quickly, <laughs> I'm afraid the amount is going to go down. I said, brother, I'm in your driveway. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Generosity. The Lord is the owner. One-tenth belongs to him. That is participating in, in generosity, and man, that brings the bounce back. So Jesus tells us, allows this story to be in there of generosity displayed and two people reacting to it. One guy, Judas, he was unhappy. He saw this lady display the most extravagant generosity he'd ever seen, one year's wages, and he has this to say. Why wasn't that sold and given to the poor? Now, the Bible tells you right away, he didn't care anything about the poor. Nothing. He had a problem with controlling money. He had a problem being generous. In fact, the Bible says he had control of the money box. And he was stealing from God's 
money. He was stealing from Jesus. Who does that? We have in all of our churches, all the churches that are watching, we have online giving, which you have been so uh, wonderful to adopt. And we have uh, boxes outside, generosity boxes. And these boxes are where you can put a check in there or cash if you're giving through the envelope that you receive. I don't believe there's anybody in this auditorium or anyone listening to the sound of my voice that would break into one of those boxes and take that money. You know why? Well, you're good people, but what else? Whose money is it? It's God's money. And I believe you have such a fear of the Lord that you would not take money from the God box. But what about the money you keep from putting into the God box? How does the Lord feel about that? Question for you, who gave Judas the money box for all the disciples in the first place? Jesus. Jesus was the boss. He's the one that gave Judas the money box. Why did you do that knowing he's a thief? Because Jesus believes in you, and he believes that you can grow from this area of immaturity into generosity, but at the end of the day, Judas couldn't do it. He couldn't. He remained a deflated life. Let's switch over now to the second question I asked you earlier. What is the greatest bounce to life? It is generosity. Generosity will put the bounce back in your life. When you're generous, generous with your time and when you're generous with your treasure, it absolutely does something supernatural to you. You know, if you just plot it out and, and, and put the numbers in place, you know, it doesn't add up. I can't be better ahead if I'm giving 10% away. I know it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. It, it's, it's not natural. It's supernatural. God just says, I get in the equation when you honor me with your 10%. When you're generous, I'm stepping into your life. Generosity consists not of the sum given, the, but the manner in which it is bestowed. I give it, and I give it generously. What is it about this lady named Mary? Mary of Bethany. Mary and Martha, two sisters, and they had a younger brother uh, named Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was a younger man. And this was an affluent family. I don't know if it's heart attack. The Bible is silent on how the brother died. It just says he died. And it was sudden and unexpected. And it broke their heart. And the two sisters are absolutely devastated. And the question that's on their mind is, where is Jesus? And when can he get here? And in another sermon, I'll preach. Jesus purposely delayed being there when uh, Lazarus died. Uh, I'll get into that some other time. It's such a fascinating uh, spiritual concept. <sighs> Jesus arrives at Lazarus' tomb three days after he died, and he walks up to the tomb, and, and the ladies come out, and they're brokenhearted. They said, Lord, if you had been here, have you ever asked, you ever said that to the Lord? Lord, if you had been here, if you had shown up, I wouldn't have lost this. I wouldn't have lost my marriage. I wouldn't have lost whatever it is. I, if you would have shown up and the Lord, he cried. The Lord cried. He, he broke down and wept. Jesus wept. Shortest scripture in the Bible. When he saw how broken they were, he wept. Jesus wept. And then he dries his tears and he says, Lazarus, come out of there. And they said, Lord, he's been in there three days. His body's decomposing. This is not good. The Lord said, let him come out of there. He comes hopping out, wrapped up like a mummy. What would that do to your heart if you're someone you love dearly in your family, younger, unexpectedly died, and the Lord brought him back to life? What would your heart be? My heart would be filled with Gratitude, 
And so was her. Mary was filled with light. And she says, what can I do to repay Jesus for what he did for us? He said, I'm going to throw the biggest banquet this part of the country has ever seen. And I'm RSVP. I'm sending out invitations. You RSVP. We're throwing a banquet in the honor of Jesus Christ. That's what we do here every Sunday morning at Life Family. We throw a banquet for Jesus Christ. She said, I'm throwing a banquet. And she, I mean, she went all out. And she's looking at the room. And there's her brother sitting at the table with Jesus. The man that was dead just two months ago. Laughing. And eating with the Lord and talking and premeditated. She had made an enormous withdrawal from her savings. She went and got a year's salary, a year's salary, and changed it into this perfume that was so costly. And she brings a year's salary into that room after the meal had already finished and she kneels down in front of Jesus and she pours a year's wages on his feet and then she takes her hair and dries his feet and the Bible says the whole room (laughs) the whole room was filled with that fragrance You know, there's something about generosity and worship. When you worship the Lord and you're giving, it just changes the fragrance of the room and it puts bounce back in your life. If you will participate in this generosity plan, biblical generosity of one-tenth, I I just can't describe what's going to happen to you. The viscosity is coming back to your heart the life oil of the Holy Spirit. Would one year's salary be generous to you? If you, if you wrote a check today for one year's salary, would that be generous? It would absolutely be generous. What motivated her to be so generous? Gratitude. Lord, I thank you for giving my brother back to me. I thank you for saving us. I thank you for being our Lord. I thank you. Have you ever just spent time just worshiping the Lord? Lord, I thank you. I thank you for everything you've given me. When you are overwhelmed with gratitude, it it, it comes forward in generosity. Biblical generosity looks like this. There are three steps to it. Uh, The first step is tithe. If you're a Jesus follower, if you're not a Jesus follower, ignore everything I'm about to say. This is just for Jesus followers. Uh, But if you're a Jesus follower, uh, tithe. Tithing is one-tenth of your paycheck, however you get paid, and whatever those resources are. You bring 10% to your church. That's life family. Wherever you go to church in life family, you bring it to the church. This is undesignated. I I believe in the church and I believe in your very aggressive plan to reach the community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe in you. It's an undesignated thing. Second step is offering. Sometimes we get this confused. We want to give an offering, uh, but it doesn't become an offering until after it was a tithe. You have to reach level one before it is really uh, a level two. This offering can be designated. I want to go to students. I want to go to uh, whatever that the offering can be designated. We take up designated offerings all the time. The third step is, uh, is the extravagant gift. And very few of us ever get there. That's Mary of Bethany type giving. I mean, this is, uh, I'm good here. I'm good here. I- I'm asking God to help me with this. The extravagant gift, the gift that changes everything. Jesus said, do you see what she did for me? Hey, Judas, do you see what she did for me? She anointed my body for burial. He knew 
In six days, he would be dead. He was impaled on a cross, and because of the law, he had to be off the cross by sundown. They had no time to prep his body for burial. That's why the women came back on Sunday with spices to, to prepare him properly. But he didn't need preparation on Sunday. He was already healed. He said, this, she is anointing my body. The smell of generosity was on the Lord, on the cross, in all that blood and all that sweat. He could smell the generosity. <laughs> and when they put him in the tomb, the fragrance that changed the atmosphere in that tomb was the extravagant gift of Mary. You can drink the water, yeah. You can drink the water or you can prime the pump. Be refreshed yourself and others that will come after you. The decision is yours. God invented giving for our benefit. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You can give without loving but you cannot love without giving. I, uh, I appreciate you allowing me to preach around at all of the campuses this summer. I had such a great time preaching, it, seeing the extended family, meeting people I've never met, my extended family, being there in person. I just rejoiced in that. And uh, when I, Denise and I, when we went to, to the downtown campus at ACL, and after I preached there, that's so much fun. What a, what a cool place. I love all of you, downtown campus. Uh, you know, there's a pig that goes to that church. I, I'm talking about a full-on hog. They roll him up in a, uh, in a wagon. It's a hog. And he loves our church. His name is Gumbo, and I don't know if that's prophetic or what, but I don't know. Uh, but after the service, you know, you've got, you've got software CEOs sitting next to a homeless man. You've got, I mean, it's the most eclectic uh, mixture of cultures. And I was just standing outside on, uh, uh, on Willie Nelson Boulevard. Um watching people come out of the service after it was over and we'd worshiped and it was just so beautiful and this beautiful lady I think she was maybe in her 20s I don't know early 30s came up to me and Denise she said can I have a moment with you sure she said uh, can you thank them for me I said thank who thank them she pointed back to all the congregants who were mixing and mingling and laughing. Can you thank them for me? Well, sure. What would I thank them for? She said, uh, the lifestyle I was in, uh, I would be dead in just a few more weeks. That's where I was going. The drug addiction and the lifestyle I was going to be dead. And I stumbled, drunk, hangover, stumbled into this church. And God touched my heart and changed me. Can you thank all those people for me? I said, yes, I can. And I thought of all the people who paid the lease, the personnel, created the programs, did the advertising. I thought of all the people in six years, that campus is six years old. I thought about all the people who gave unselfishly to create a space for this broken lady 
to find Jesus Christ. Can you thank all of them for me? Hey, I want to thank you for getting it. And I want to thank you for not drinking the glass, draining the glass, but investing it in the pump that refreshes you and others who will come along. Hallelujah. Hey, thank you for being a part of service today. We hope that God's word met you right where you are. We hope you took something that's gonna help you move forward in God's best for your life. We wanna hear from you. There's a link right below this video you can click on. Send us a note, let us know what's going on in your world, where you're watching from, maybe even how we can be praying for you. We love believing God with you for God's best in your life. You can do that by clicking that link, sending us a short note. Hey, maybe also you've made a decision to follow Jesus recently. That excites us. We celebrate with you. We want to hear from you. We want to know what God is doing in your life. You can text the word follow to 22999. We'll respond back with a link that you can click on. Go to our website. We have some great next steps for you. How to move forward in that decision that you're, you've made to follow Jesus. Whether it's water baptism, whether it's getting in a life group, or maybe even planning in God's house right here with us in Life Track. We know whatever that next step is. God has great plans for your life and we want to be a part of seeing all of God's best fulfilled in your heart and in your life. We hope you're doing awesome. We can't wait to see you next time. If you don't have a home church, we would love to invite you to be part of Life Family. Remember, you belong here. Join us again next Sunday or anytime throughout the week. Hit that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Hope to see you again soon.